from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him, asked Jesus, a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. As always, context is helpful in getting to what this passage means for us in Nashville in the insane century that we're calling the year 2020. Matthew's gospel places this story in a series of stories about religious authorities coming to Jesus to ask him questions and to try to trap him and accuse him of heresy and get him out of their way. The person who is described in this passage as a lawyer um, would have been an expert in the Mosaic law, in the Jewish law that they lived by. The people with the social and religious power, they want to know how Jesus fits into their structure, fits into their world, basically so they can figure out how to get rid of him. Now, to be fair, Jesus wasn't exactly laying low in the chapters before this. It's understandable they would want to figure out Jesus. See, this comes after he's flipped tables and whooped up on people in the temple. He's told three pointed offensive parables and cursed a fig tree. So Jesus was definitely getting noticed. The questions they ask him are trap questions. Questions that no matter how you answer them, you're gonna be in trouble. There's no way to pass these tests or so they think. Now, in fir at first glance, this really doesn't seem like much of a test. Which is the greatest commandment? Well, that's just a matter of opinion, right? But at that time, there were considered to be 613 commandments in the law of Moses. And which one was the greatest one or how you rank them was a matter of a lot of debate. Some people said all of them are equally important and you have to observe all of them. That would be the Pharisees. Others said you have to have some give and take and rank them in order to just deal with daily life. That would be the Herodians and the Sadducees. Well, knowing that, helps us understand the weight of this question they're asking. They ask Jesus, which commandment in the law is greatest? No matter what he answers, Jesus can't keep everybody happy. We know that feeling. It's good to know that when we know, when we feel like we can't please everybody or anybody, Jesus gets that. Now, this isn't the first time Jesus has asked a trap question. Sometimes he's answered these questions with a, a parable. Sometimes he answers with a question. So we kind of expect that same kind of, here's something to think about it kind of answer. But Jesus is absolutely straightforward here. He quotes scripture. Scripture that all of them would have heard all their lives. First, Deuteronomy 6 verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And then Leviticus 19, 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. So nice and succinct. So brief to the point. You know, it would fit on a t-shirt or a bumper sticker or a refrigerator magnet. Love God, love people. So easy to say, so hard to live out. Now, there are definitely sticky ethical questions that, that are just crazy hard to figure out. So most of the time, though, our lives aren't sticky ethical questions. Whether I'm rude to someone, that's not really ethically complex. 
making room in my day to spend some time to focus on God with prayer or reading, that's not hard to understand, even if it's hard to do sometimes. You know, I, as I thought of this, I thought, I wonder what it would be like to develop the habit of a morning prayer that says, today, God, help me love you and love people. And thank you for loving me. And then at the end of the day, to just ask God, where did I love you? And where did I love people? And where, where could I have seen that differently or done more of those things? Love God, love people. It's simple, but hard. But you know what, Telos and Southminster? We are a pretty resilient bunch. We can do hard things. More about that later. Love God, love people. Can you tell I'm trying to say that often enough that it just echoes in your heads this whole week after this? The word used for love here is agape. Agape is love that seeks the good of the other regardless of the cost to self. Love that has very little to do with emotion and everything to do with commitment and follow through. One author put it this way, quote, the love that is being called for is not emotion. It is not liking, getting along with, desiring, or feeling warm about. The love Jesus is talking about here is trust, loyalty, enduring devotion, being attached to. You may actually hate your neighbor, but you will still love them in the biblical sense if you continue to act for their well-being, end quote. So it isn't about our feelings. But you know what? Behaving in a loving way towards someone, it has a sneaky way of turning into actual compassion and caring for people we might originally not have liked all that much. Okay, so we've got the concept and the idea. Love God, love people, and it's agape love. How do we take these words and weave them into our lives? I'd like you all to time travel with me in your imaginations. We're hopping forward on the calendar just a little bit to a time after the presidential election has been decided. Oh yes, she did go there. The winner has accepted, the loser has conceded. I want you to imagine that your candidate has lost. Imagine your disappointment, grief, anger, shock, the hurt, the fear of what's to become of us as a nation. We in this church are a mix of red and blue voters, what some people call a purple church. In this disappointment, it's going to be reality for a good number of us. A good percentage of your brothers and sisters and siblings here at Southminster and Telos will be feeling those feelings. This election is incredibly important. The stakes are very high. The campaign season has been bitter and divisive. So there's a lot of passion on each side. We are all exhausted by the pandemic and all that 2020 has brought us. But after this election, none of us here have to govern, but we do have to figure out how to keep being church together. We will still be neighbors. So what happens when this election is over? Do we gloat if our guy won? Okay, maybe just a little bit in the privacy of our own homes with people who agree with us. Maybe, but please not with one another here in our purple church. Gloating is for when UT beats Bama or vice versa. I think one of the best opportunities to take Jesus's words in this passage and apply them in real life is coming up after this election. What would it be like in the aftermath of this election when as we're imagining, your candidate has lost, and you have to sit in a meeting or in worship, either on Zoom or in per person as time goes on, you have to sit with people whose candidate has won. 
And what if, because those people have taken seriously the commandment to love their neighbors as themselves, they don't look at you simply as someone whose candidate lost, but as their neighbor, a child of God with dignity, in need of love, and they treat you with respect and compassion. What if their words were gentle and kind without being condescending or self-righteous? Now, the Democrats and Republicans holding, who hold elective office, they can stay huddled in their little camps and, and ignore one another and just fire shots through the media. If we want this church to thrive, we don't have that luxury. What might it be like to be loved well if your candidate loses? Not pitied, not condescended to, not scorned, loved. I think we have it in us to be that kind of place. Now I'd like for you to imagine what it would be like to give that kind of love. How might it be to see those who'd vote differently from you in the light of this filter? Love God, love people. How might it change the climate of things if we each committed to extending love that doesn't have all that much to do with emotion, but has a definite, has everything to do with a commitment to loving God and loving people? I think we could accomplish amazing things doing that. Because at the end of this very high stakes election, we will still have to figure out how to be church together. And Jesus makes it pretty clear here. Love God, love people. Here's another example, a little closer to home. We are a unique group. We have in the Southminster Telos milieu, if you will, we have a lot of boomers. We have a lot of millennials, a few Gen Zers, and not much in between there. That's pretty unique. So let's talk technology for a minute. For anyone under 45 years of age, you probably don't remember when you learned how to use a mouse because you were so young when you learned that. Now, storing important information and storing documents Signing documents electronically, no big deal to y'all. Communicating electronically is second nature. You barely remember, if you remember, a time without cell phones. And that is awesome. And that is the future of communication and managing information. If we want our church family to grow, we have to head towards being proficient in those ways of communicating. But for those of you over 55, you probably vividly remember the frustration and the awkwardness of learning to use a computer mouse. Learning that storing things electronically and not in hard copies, that may still feel not real to you, or communicating vitally important information digitally by email or text message, or it, it doesn't feel like a real conversation. It may feel more like, you know, we should use email or texting as a way to set up the phone call or face-to-face -face conversation where we'll have the real conversation. Am I ringing any bells here with y'all? <laughs> And then when people talk about technology and ways of communicating electronically or on the web, you feel left out, maybe incompetent, definitely frustrated. Mark and I watched a movie last night um, and this, this guy had been in prison and he got out and he went to go look at some security footage and, and the kid, you know, and managing the store he said where's the where's the recording and the kid went it's in the cloud and this guy who had been out of the world for a long time was just 
you know, don't be joking with me. Where is, you know, because that was a foreign concept. So we have this big gap in the ways we at Southminster are comfortable in communicating. It's a really wide chasm over which to build a bridge. It's a tricky span in which to build community. Of course, we're gonna be frustrated by it. Communicating with one another and with the world outside this church is vitally important and we do it in such different ways. All of us have made and are making assumptions that we're gonna to have to rethink. We are going to have trouble getting something done. We're gonna be frustrated and not being as productive as we'd like. But you know what? Productivity isn't the goal. Discipleship and ministry are our goals. And in our passage today, Jesus is telling us that the most important things are to love God and love people. What might it be like to be a place where millennials and Gen Zers are not criticized by the boomers and where the boomer, where the gen, millennials and Gen Xers avoid consciously ever developing an okay boomer attitude. We, a place where we learn to laugh at our differences and figure them out with love, agape love. Love that seeks the other's good, regardless of the cost to self. And if you're thinking, I don't think I can do that. You're right. None of us can go from thinking less of people to choosing to love them with just flipping a switch. Not in our own strength. Here's the good news. Jesus doesn't ask us to do this in our own strength. We have the Holy Spirit as our guide and comforter. And it will probably take a lot of prayer to get there. It will take a lot of loving God to get to where we can love each other well. But as I said before, I believe in us. I think God believes in us. In Southminster, in Telos, and what we're trying to build here, we can do hard things because God, through the Holy Spirit, is forever pulling us in the direction of living out these two most important commandments. Love God, love people. Amen.